Achalasia is an extremely high yield topic for many shelf exams, such as surgery, family medicine, internal medicine, and of course, the step two CK exam. The aim of this video is to provide you with information about everything you need to know about achalasia so you can score extra points on your exams. So watch this video until the end for extremely high yield images and high yield comparisons of other esophageal motility disorders. So the name achalasia tells you what this disease or disorder is about. A means absent and chalasia means relaxation. Therefore, achalasia is absent relaxation. Achalasia is an esophageal motility disorder where there is inadequate relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. It's extremely important to note that achalasia is a chronic disorder. So how can these patients present? Well, they present with chronic dysphagia and this is the main presenting symptom. These patients often have a difficulty swallowing liquids and food. They may also experience regurgitation. But of course, the symptoms of achalasia are not limited to dysphagia and regurgitation. Other symptoms include heartburn or retrosternal pain. These patients may also have a history of heartburn that is refractory to PPI use. So in a question, you might see that a patient is taking a PPI, however, their symptoms still persist. In this case, please consider something like achalasia. So these patients may also experience mild weight loss, but there are other clinical features that you should be aware of. So these can be highlighted by knowing the different causes of achalasia. So the causes of achalasia can be divided into two big subgroups and that's primary and secondary. So primary achalasia is the most common type and it is usually due to idiopathic causes. However, the secondary cause of achalasia, that's a bit extensive, but we are going to focus on these. So this includes esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, and Chagas disease. Please note that this group of secondary causes of achalasia is called pseudoachalasia. Pseudoachalasia is due to a narrowing of the distal esophagus secondary to causes other than denervation, such as esophageal cancer, which can closely mimic achalasia, hence its name, pseudoachalasia, fake achalasia. So clues for pseudoachalasia can be red flag signs, such as age greater than 60, rapid onset of symptoms, and significant unintentional weight loss. So these red flag findings closely relate to esophageal cancer or stomach cancer as a possible cause, but the other cause of pseudoachalasia we need to focus on, which is extremely high yield, is Chagas disease. Chagas disease is also called American trypanosomiasis. It is caused by a motile protozoa called Trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma cruzi is endemic in rural areas of Central and South America. It's very important that this is not confused with African trypanosomiasis, which is caused by trypanosoma brucei. So how does Chagas disease develop? Well, trypanosoma cruzei can destroy the myenteric plexi in the esophagus, intestines, and ureters, 
causing secondary achalasia, megacolon, and mega ureter, respectively. Patients with Chagas disease can develop periorbital edema, also called romanocyne, and it is specific for Chagas disease. Interestingly, this sign can also be called a chagoma. So suspect Chagas disease if a patient presents with symptoms of achalasia, but they also have this finding. Or if they are from a country in Central or South America, or they have signs of megacolon or megaureters. Nifrotimux is the drug of choice for treating patients with Chagas disease. So we discussed the clinical features of achalasia and how to classify it, whether it's primary or secondary achalasia. So now let's take a look at how can we diagnose patients with achalasia. So these patients can do a barium swallow and this can reveal the classic bird beak sign. So these patients have a dilatation of the proximal esophagus with stenosis of the gastroesophageal junction or the lower part of the esophagus. We can also do manometry to evaluate the contractility in the esophagus. So in patients with achalasia, manometry usually reveals a decreased amplitude of the peristalsis in the mid esophagus. There's also an increased tone and incomplete relaxation at the lower esophageal sphincter. Because of this incomplete relaxation at the lower esophageal sphincter, there can also be a note of high lower esophageal sphincter resting pressure. So because the lower esophageal sphincter cannot relax, there is high pressure there. And finally, we have the upper endoscopy. So upper endoscopy must be done in all the patients with dysphagia or achalasia. It is done to rule out pseudoachalasia. So of course, when taking the history, we want to rule out like red flag signs such as um, rapid significant weight loss, their age, but we have to do an upper endoscopy regardless. So we did the barium swallow, the manometry, and the upper endoscopy. What are some complications that can arise as a result of these diagnostic procedures? Well, the main one to be aware of is esophageal rupture. So this is a complication of instrumentation in the esophagus such as an upper endoscopy. So we should always suspect this in patients who become acutely ill or hypotensive after these procedures. If you suspect esophageal rupture, the next best step is to do a water soluble contrast. And you may see something like on the left here, or if you do a chest x-ray, you might note a widening of the mediastinum, as you see in the picture on the right. So how can we treat these patients? Well, first we need to assess if they have a low surgical risk or a high surgical risk. So if they have a low surgical risk, then we can do more definitive management such as a pneumatic dilation or Heller's myotomy. However, if these patients have a high surgical risk, then we can implement the use of a botulinum toxin injection or calcium channel blockers. Leave in the comments below what other disorders or diseases can be treated with calcium channel blockers because examiners like to test questions like this like say oh achalasia can be managed with calcium channel blocker and then they describe this whole scenario with this other disease and you have to know that it also can be treated with calcium channel blockers so they kind of 
relate to different disorders with similar management and quiz you on it. So if you know other disorders that can be treated with calcium channel blockers, please comment down below. So achalasia is a risk factor for esophageal cancer, but which type of esophageal cancer? There are two main types, squamous cell cancer and adenocarcinoma. So achalasia actually increases the risk of squamous cell cancer. Other risk factors for squamous cell cancer include smoking and alcohol consumption. And one of the major risk factors for esophageal cancer due to an adenocarcinoma is Barrett's esophagus. This is also very high yield to know because they can ask you risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma or risk factor for adenocarcinoma and you have to know this well so you don't confuse each risk factor. So we just spoke about a lot of things so let's summarize everything. Achalasia is an esophageal motility disorder and it is characterized by chronic dysphagia, heartburn that is often refractory to PPIs, and mild weight loss. However, it is crucial to look out for red flag signs such as age greater than 60 and significant unintentional weight loss. So causes of achalasia can be separated into primary or secondary causes. Of course, primary is the most common and it is due to idiopathic causes. However, secondary causes of achalasia is also called pseudoachalasia. And the more common types of secondary or pseudoachalasia are esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, and Chagas disease. We can diagnose achalasia by doing a barium swallow that will reveal a bird beak deformity or manometry that will reveal a high resting pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter because of its inability to relax. And for all patients that have dysphagia or achalasia, we have to do an upper endoscopy. So how can we treat these patients is dependent on if they have a high or low surgical risk. If they have a low surgical risk, we can do pneumatic dilation or Heller's myotomy. However, if they have a high surgical risk, then we can do Botox injections or calcium channel blockers. One of the reasons why achalasia is commonly tested is because of its potential to be confused with other esophageal motility disorders, one of them being esophageal spasms. So here are barium swallows of both of those disorders. So as you can see, achalasia on the left, you have the bird's beak deformity at the lower esophageal sphincter. However, in esophageal spasms, you have a corkscrew appearance. Now let's look at this table that distinguishes key defining features of achalasia, esophageal spasms, and nutcracker esophagus so you won't confuse these disorders on your exam. So one way of distinguishing between them is the lower esophageal sphincter pressure, which is high in achalasia, but it is normal in the other disorders. On barium swallow, like previously mentioned, achalasia has a bird beak deformity, esophageal spasm has a corkscrew deformity, while nutcracker esophagus has a nutcracker deformity. Manometry. So in achalasia, there is a high lower esophageal sphincter pressure. In esophageal spasm, you have coordinated and multiple contractions. In nutcracker esophagus, you have pressures greater than 400 millimeters per mercury. The normal esophageal pressure is usually between 40 to 100 millimeters per mercury. So this is significantly higher. So these are some key ways how you can distinguish between esophageal motility disorders, 
so that you can score major points on your board or shelf exam. I hope this was helpful for you. If you have any other important tips, notes, or mnemonics, please comment them down below to help the powerhouse community. As always, if you liked this video, be sure to power up the like button, hit subscribe, and that notification bell. And to continue learning more, click this video right here.